OK? Hi, and welcome, everyone. My name is Jens. I work for Red Hat. And uh, I prepared this presentation together with my colleague, Pradeep Dai. He can't be here today. So this talk is about how we can leverage confidential computing technology to enhance the security and the resilience of data in use in the Kubernetes control plane. So before we jump in, um, I'd just like to get a feeling for the audience. Who here has heard of confidential computing? Can you show your hand? OK. Who has heard of uh, Kata containers? Also quite a few. And uh, who has heard of confidential containers? Oh, still also a few hands. Great. So um, let's jump in. But let's see why the control plane, what it does, and why it needs to be protected in the beginning. Um, so the control plane, you know, I think it's already in the name. Um, it controls your cluster. And if you own it, you're basically root in your cluster. So what does it do? Well, it does orchestrates all major cluster activities, um, like deploying applications, controlling pods and nodes, scaling resources up and down. So really complex tasks. And it also houses sensitive data. Um, it houses secrets that could be passwords or API keys. Um, it has state data, which represents the current state of the cluster, and many more things that need to be protected. It has access control, um, and it also the API is the big part of it. Um, it's the primary interface through which users and external systems interact with the cluster. And it receives requests for operations, then translates it into internal communication protocols and ensures the correct execution. So it has a really pivotal role, really, um, and its security is uh, of great importance, of course. So there's a subset of control components that we want to focus on here. And it's those that are end user facing. So we call it, I call it request serving control plane components. And these include, of course, the API server, but there's also others like Ingress or OS. And as, then there's also um, Kubernetes distro specific services. So these components are all critical because they handle requests from users directly. Um, now, let's take a closer look. Um, the bottom line is we need to protect those pods from unauthorized access and from manipulation so that trust can be established. Um, it's, they are very exposed. That's in the nature of these components. They need to be accessible at all times and listen for incoming requests. So this direct exposure um, to external entities, losers, and software um, makes them basically the first line of defense and also a prime target for potential attackers. Uh, it has a lot of complexities, like it handles a complex array of operations. It has to parse data. It has to interpret protocols. It, does, um, it performs authentication and authorization checks. So, and the complexity of these um, tasks can lead to vulnerabilities, especially if there are oversights in a management. It has a lot of um, privileged operations. Um, and as I said, it mentions it does also does um, authorization. And because of this complexity, there's also a chance of misconfiguration. So these are just some examples. I think we all have seen some examples. And we all know that it's not unlikely that there will be more vulnerabilities. So how do we protect uh, the control plane and clusters in general at the moment? Of course, there's a, a large number of already existing projects and practices and um, best practices and methods that we apply. And they are all important and will not change. What we propose here is just something that comes on top of that in addition to existing things. So we want, just want to add something, defense in depth, basically. So now let's take a look at how clusters are used and how it evolves often. So Often, a journey starts with a single shared cluster, means shared control plane. And there's many good reasons to do this. There's some resource efficiency, cost saving, um, there's simple administration, um, they're fast and easy to provision. And for isolation between tenants, here we're looking at um, 
soft multi-tenancy, which is often enough for, use case, for many use cases. But at some point, more tenants join, and we run out of resources, or maintenance becomes harder. Um, trust changes with a growing number of tenants. So you create more clusters. And some, reason why, some reasons why companies do this are for, for compliance requirements um, from customers or projects. We need more independence, more flexibility. Um, we need more performance, more resources. Um, we need maybe predictable costs. Um, and maybe also we need a strong isolation. We need to move towards more hard multi-tenancy. And then often we end up implementing something like managed control planes. So in that case, and there are many implementations of this. Um, Gardner is one, but also all major public cloud providers that offer managed services implement some form of this architecture. And then there's also HyperShift. And today I want to focus on, on HyperShift. And now you'll say, wait, isn't that OpenShift specific? Um, yes, it is at the moment. You can get it to run on HyperShift, but it's work in progress to make that more easy. Um, so I'll talk about the example of HyperShift today. Um, but I, what I will show is not only applicable to HyperShift. It's just it's a generic solution or generic techniques that we can apply to all of these different implementations and in general to Kubernetes workloads, Kubernetes pods. So it's not specific to HyperShift. I just use it as an example that was um, easy to use for me. So just a brief um, introduction to that. This is what a classic cluster looks like. Um, you have control plane nodes, and then you have a set of machine tools that's all in one entity and controlled by a single team. And then HyperShift changes that. HyperShift um, basically decouples the control plane from the data plane from workers and also separates the network's domains and provides a shared interface through which admins and SREs can easily operate like a fleet of clusters. So now the control plane acts and behaves like any other workload. The same rich stack that used to monitor, secure, operate your applications um, can be reused for managing the control plane. So there are many more advantages, but I'll stop here. This is not uh, what the main topic is. Um, we've seen transitioning to manage control plane solutions like this can bring efficiency and scalability. But it also introduces additional complexity in terms of security and trust. And even so, the fundamental trust relationships and roles, they remain consistent across these different setups, the ways in which we need to manage and uh, secure these setups evolve. So now we're going to take a closer look at how trust is established and maintained and trust relationships. And also, I'll go, also go into why um, technical assurance becomes increasingly important uh, in these complex environments. So. Let's talk about trust. I'm the workload owner. Um, the cloud provider is the infrastructure owner. And I want to use my software in the cloud. But maybe I'm hesitant. But who do I have to trust? There's different groups. It starts already in-house, right? There's a whole bunch of teams or groups that I need to trust. There's, admin, there's admins. There's software production teams. There's developers and more. Then for cloud providers, we have, of course, SREs and all their other personnel and software that they run to maintain their infrastructure and um, their processes as well. And then there's third parties, um, other tenants, maybe other container providers, third party software. So in a typical Kubernetes context, um, the infrastructure provider, like a public cloud provider, is not considered a threat agent. It is a trusted actor of a Kubernetes deployment. But in a confidential computing context, that assumption no longer applies. And the infrastructure provider is a potential threat agent. So confidential computing in general um, 
and controller containers in particular, it tried to protect Kubernetes workload um, from the uh, workload owners, from the infrastructure provider. So any software component that belongs to the infrastructure and that can also be the control plane um, is untrusted. So there's all these different groups. And the question is, do I have to trust them? To what degree? Do they need all this trust in order to perform their job? And often the answer is no. The same is true for um, in-house, all the groups that I trust. Um, do they need this to perform their job? And often the answer is no. And the same is true also for third parties. Do I have to trust them to this degree? Often the answer is no. So if we take the infrastructure provider as a threat agent, then what are the threat vectors? There's container images, and the infrastructure provider could potentially tamper and access my pod container images during storage or pull operations. There's the memory infrastructure provider could manipulate or access or just view the in-use memory of my applications while they're running. And then there's also the data um, that are stored. The infrastructure provider could also um, tamper with them, change them, view them. And what we want is to reduce the software and the people and the processes that we have to trust. And this is where confidential computing technology comes into play. It boils down to operational assurance versus technical assurance, or as I call it here, trust-based and procedural assurance versus um, systemic and cryptographic assurance. So one says, we promise not to mess with your data, and the other one says, we can't mess with your data. One says, we promise not to, the other one, we can't. And as a project that has the goal of bringing confidential computing to cloud-native workloads, to Kubernetes, and it's called Confidential Containers. It's a sandbox and project in the CNCF. Um, there's a healthy and, and growing community of contributors from many companies. There's cloud providers, ISVs, SaaS companies, many hardware vendors, and of course, companies like Red Hat um, that contribute. So what does confidential container do exactly? What does it add? It reduces the trusted, computing, the trusted compute base. So it's based on virtualization technology and Kata containers. Remember Kata containers? Um, you run your container wrapped inside a lightweight VM, and from the user's point of view, it looks and feels like a normal pod. So Confidential Containers combines Kata containers and TE's trusted execution environments. It means the VM that is created by Kata is a confidential VM. And that means it makes use of the TE and its capabilities. Guest memory is encrypted, and it allows for remote attestation. And without it, workloads were isolated um, from each other on the same host. And also, my host was better isolated from malicious workloads. But um, so when you break out of a container, you're still contained inside a VM and not on the host. Coco adds confidentiality. It adds protection for your workload from the host and the infrastructure and organization that operates it. So going back to our threat vectors, um, we talked about it. These are the threat vectors that the COCO project tries to address. Uh, so what are the mitigations? Um, for container images, we shift the control of the, of the container images away from the infrastructure owner. These images, they must either be signed or encrypted um, to ensure the infrastructure owner cannot manage, store, or pull these images. Only the workload itself should be capable of doing this, of pulling decrypting, verifying, and possibly storing them. 
So storing encrypted and signed images in confidential memory ensures that they remain inaccessible to the infrastructure provider. And by this, it's mitigating threat factor number one. Then there's memory. Um, exclusive use of confidential encrypted memory. So the COCO model mandates that workloads run only in encrypted memory. And this offers hardware level assurance that the infrastructure provider cannot tamper with the memory while it's in use. By this addressing threat factor number two. And then there's storage. Confidential containers ensure Kubernetes pod volumes are encrypted and maintain integrity. It will um, not allow to unprotected volumes into be uh, at a station injected secrets or they will not be mounted or created by confidential containers. So, and this safeguard basically ensures that we mitigate threat vector number three. Okay, let's bring it together. In the first part of the talk, um, we talked about managed control planes and we talked about the control plane itself, why it needs to be protected. Um, now, then we talked about confidential containers and confidential computing. So now let's try and bring it together. The scenario is um, now organizations are like increasingly adopting these models where multiple Kubernetes control planes are hosted on a single centralized management cluster. And each tenant's control plane is isolated within its own namespace. So while the actual workload, they run on separate node pools. But in addition, um, cloud tenants, you know, they're worried about privilege misuse and malicious insiders, exploits, things like this. What are the risks? Um, we've seen that managed control planes, they um, bring efficiency and scalability, but they also bring risks. There's still cross-tenant vulnerabilities with namespaces. There's uh, still a potential threat that one tenant might access or impact um, another's resources. Um, there's still the problem of excessive resource usage, which will affect other tenants. Um, so what do I want as a tenant? Um, I want full control over my environment. No matter how shared it is, um, I want to feel like I'm in a private setting. And of course, um, I want to ensure that my control plane is the control plane that I intend to run. And I want it to be security checked and its integrity verified. So what can we do? Let's drill down into uh, the scenario here a little bit. I have um, a few also control planes with the, um, consisting of the known services running as pods in a namespace. Um, and we have a set of node pools where our workloads run. But the node pools, they are not interesting for our example here. So we concentrate just on the control plane. And we pick a component and run it as a confidential container. So for that, we need, um, of course, uh, a hypershift setup. We need to um, install the operator and create the hosted clusters, which create the um, control planes. And for confidential containers, we need uh, the operator. To install the operator, it will deploy the runtime that we need to run um, Kata container and the configuration that turns it into confidential containers. So when we have the setup, um, we modify the API server, as an example. And literally, all we need to do here is to add a few lines uh, to the deployment specification. There's a pod, we modify the pod template because we need to add a runtime class. And this runtime class was created when we installed the confidential containers operator. So this will guarantee that my API server will not run as a normal run C-based container. It will use the Kata container runtime and the configuration that makes it uh, use a confidential VM backed by the hardware TE instead of uh, a normal VM. So memory encryption guarantees the confidentiality and nobody can dump my guest memory and, and look at it, um, but it does not guarantee the integrity of my API server. I want to know that it runs the, in a secure enclave, that's one. And on top, I want to know that it's exactly 
the API server unchanged and not tampered with that I need to run. So how would that work? This is where the attestation part comes in. So there are different ways to achieve this. One is that we store a signature in the KBS component, which is controlled by the user, not the cloud provider, or an admin, it's by me. And I configured confidential containers in a way that it connects to my KBS during the attestation process. So we use the KBS and attestation service to run the attestation process for my API server. And only after successful attestation, um, that is, we verified the things that I just mentioned, it will start up. If this attestation process fails, my container will not even start up. If it fails, it won't even run. And this is how I know that something is not right. So if the attestation, uh, attestation was successful and uh, my components have started, they will run, and they will run in the secure enclave in my confidential container backed by the hardware CE where memory is encrypted. So this is the full um, confidential container attestation workflow. I will not go into full detail here because um, we still have want to show a demo, a short demo. Um, but if you have questions around this, um, I have lots of additional information in the slides. We have a whole series of blocks around how this works, especially for confidential containers and how we got here. Um, you can find all of this information in the slides. So now it's time for a demo. So I have my setup installed. I have created a hosted cluster with my HyperShift setup. And in it, I see the control plane components running as pods. So here we see a list of all of them. And we find the API server. Here it is. And now I'm going to show the runtime classes. You can't see it. So there's two runtime classes. Um, there's Kata and Kata Remote. Um, and now I open the deployment and I go to the pod template and I add the runtime class. So here you can see uh, we're adding a runtime class name with Kata Remote CC for confidential containers instead of a normal Kata container. And I close it, and my API server restarts as a confidential container. So this is unfortunate. No. OK. Here I show um, all the pods that use the runtime class name. And um, you can see <laughs> that it's the API server. and. Uh, the rest is the runtime class name. So now I mentioned the KBS that I need to run before. Um, that does part of the attestation. Um, this I have running somewhere else. That's on my control. This is the pod. I deployed this via another operator. Um, it's running here. And now I need to stop, I think. Um, my API server has already restarted, and it has already um, gone through the attestation process. Um, so now we'll show just a um, look at the logs and see uh, what happened. So this is um, basically what happens here. Um, attestation means it sends a request first, then it uh, gets a challenge as a response. And then the attestation happens on the node where my container runs. Basically, the attestation agent requests the evidence from the hardware by performing, uh, executing this command and requesting the evidence. And 
the evidence basically states that it's running in a secure enclave in a confidential VM. And I can see here that it returns um, uh, a, a response, um, including the evidence and uh, a key that's signed. And um, yeah, here I see that it returns a key. So in this case, my container was not just signed, it was um, encrypted, and I got the decryption key to decrypt the container image before it starts, before it starts running. And I think this is the end of my demo. Seen that already. So future work, um, of course, this was just a, a proof of concept, uh, a demo. Um, this needs to be integrated into Hypershift so that when I deploy my setup, I can configure it in a way. Maybe I can tell which components I want to run as confidential containers. Um, so basically, it needs integration with the tooling. What I showed in the demo was. Um, you wouldn't do that uh, eventually. It would, we would um, integrate it into the Hypershift tooling so that um, you can configure it when you create your hosted control planes. What components do you want to run as confidential containers and where would it connect to and things like this. So there's still work to, done, uh, work to be done. And also for the COCO project in general, there's um, also lots of interesting open problems to work on. Um, I've listed also some in the slides, some of the more interesting ones. Um, but in general, um, if you're interested in the space, this is a very open and welcoming community. Um, I've also added links to our community meeting. Or come talk to me uh, after the talk. Um, we are looking for more people and contributors. So yeah, these are some of the things um, that I wanted to share. I'll just leave them in the slides. Um, I just wanted to mention um, this is our GitHub. We have a Slack channel and CNCF. Um, we have a new release coming out soon. Um, and we have a weekly meeting where we discuss technical topics and release topics. But usually, we have every week one uh, interesting technical presentation from someone that is a specialist in one of the fields. And then um, I wanted to make you aware of um, our blogs that we published. Um, we published a whole series of blogs, not just about attestation, but also introductory blogs, um, blogs documenting use cases and demos that we did. Um, we've also shown some demos that at the booth, at the Red Hat booth here. Um, I can also demonstrate them for you. If you approach me, um, we've shown, for example, workloads that protect um, an AI model in a public cloud um, using in, in Azure in this example. Um, one was in TDX hardware, and the other one, other demo that we did was um, together with the startup Encrypt AI. They um, offer the protection for AI models, um, but they use homomorphic encryption, and we've shown a demo where they add confidential containers to the mix to protect a part of their setup. Um, also, there are some other uh, relevant talks if you're interested in this topic. Um, they go into more detail, into more technical detail of some parts of this. Um, there was one from last KubeCon from Jerome Piotrowski who goes more into the attestation details, how that works more uh, in detail from the kernel side of things, from the hardware side of things. Um, there's also like more an introduction talk on how to deploy confidential containers by Fabiano Filencio from the Cata project and myself. Um, and then there's also uh, previous talks um, that were interesting. The last one, Five Big Problems, was from a last KVM forum where Christoph talks about like the current five biggest problems that we're still trying to address. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. If you have questions, thank you. If there are questions, please come up to the mic so that uh, it will be on the recording and I can hear you.
Hey, um, so in a cloud-hosted uh, control plane, you're trying to uh, basically verify that the, the API server and stuff are, are as you expect. How can you trust that the cloud provider has installed the right version of uh, confidential containers and all of that, uh, and the runtime and all of that, in order to even have it validate um, when you actually go to uh, relaunch the, the API server? Like, where do, you, where do you start this whole process? Okay, um, so that's part of the Cocoa model is that you don't trust the, um, the, uh, all the components that are outside of the virtual machine. So you don't, it's part of the concept that you don't, whatever they install, if they install something that um, was tampered with, um, it will most likely, your container will not start up. Um, because if they fake the evidence or if they um, temper something in between, um, the KPS part is in your, um, in your control, so where, the, where, where you check the evidence and basically verify it. But you could decide to also let, that, let an attestation service do that, um, but the point is that part is in your control. That, that attestation is coming from the, um, the runtime back to the, the, um, the KDS, the KBS? So the attestation evidence basically um, comes from the hardware where your container is running. So once you, once it, uh, you send a request to the KBS, it needs to authenticate itself and it sends a challenge uh, with a nonce and then um, a component that runs on the node as part of the VM where your, your container runs, um, that's uh, basically just collecting the evidence by requesting it from the hardware. And then um, to run that, uh, that broker service somewhere, mm -hmm. would you, in order to get this whole thing started, would you want to run that somewhere else, like locally or something, in order to get an environment that you can have all the, the validation in and then move the, the broker service to that environment and then kind of propagate out that way? Yes, that's, that's a very um, valid deployment model. And you, you can take this wherever you want, how, how how much caution you need or what your use case is. Um, depending on how paranoid you are, you can um, run more or less on a self. You can also use cloud provider um, attestation services um, if you want, if that's enough for you, basically. Um, and they, they can also run their services in confidential um, VMs, for example. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.